And that's mostly for the people that are watching online, not for the people that are here, unless you just forgot where you were at. Like Ernie. Ernie sometimes forgets. Just kidding. All right, so we've got a great service that God has planned for us today, and we are excited for that, and for the people that are here, it doesn't look like there's many people here. There's a lot of people on vacation today, uh, which is kind of a good sign of things opening up, people being able to go and, and do stuff, um, not kind of kept in, and so with that, uh, today's call to worship is Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And also another exciting thing this morning is we get live music, live worship music. We're excited for that. So let's worship in song. God. So our announcements today, um, so if you have anything you need to communicate to the church staff, um, just send a text to one of us or a Facebook message us. Um, then the communication cards, if you're new, uh, just fill out these communication cards. Um, if you have any prayer requests, just write them on the back and send them in to us. Um, and then offerings as well. So for those of you here, we have the offering plates in the back. If you just want to put, place your offering there, or you can send it in to us by mail. Um, on the 18th of this month, we're going to Roaring Springs. We're meeting at 5.45 p.m. The cost is about $22. Bring a Coke can, and then you get $5 off. Let's go ahead and pray for our offerings. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the tithes and offerings that our congregation just gives to you, and I just pray that you'd bless them, Father God. Just bless those that keep on giving and just keep our church strong. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that was and that it was weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of, sin, of a sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in a sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature by according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have the mind set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but but the mind of the controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and in anyone that does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of the sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. The word of the Lord.
Hello again. Um, I'm up here representing the church board. So this past Tuesday, I have what I feel was one of the most blessed board meetings that we have had. Um, we showed up and we talked about the three candidates that we have, and we've narrowed it down to two. Um, and we just really feel that we need to dive into prayer right now, that we need to bring our church in with us, and we need you guys to pray for us. At the end of this board meeting, we had a, a prayer time. We just prayed over these candidates that we're looking at. And then when we were done praying, some of us started standing up and telling the board about prayer requests we have personally. And then we prayed for those people that had those personal prayer requests individually. And we just need to seek God right now. And so I'm gonna take us through a little bit of a prayer time. And I would ask that those of you here, if you would like, you can come down to the altar if you feel comfortable doing that or just stay where you're at or come to the front pew. For those of you at home, we would just ask that you would just pray with us. So I have a list of things that I feel that we should pray about. And I'm going to list some of them off. And then we're going to have moments of silence in between each thing. So the first thing I feel we need to pray for is our church board. Our church board consists of Donna, who is our church uh, board secretary, Ernie, Jan, Kyle, Greg, Terry, Jackie, Nancy, Jennifer, and then me, my name is Josh. So if I could just have a few moments of silence that we pray for our church board. Father God, I want to lift up our church board to you right now. I want to lift up Donna as she is our church board secretary, and she's the one that gets all the meetings organized and all the candidates ready to talk to us. Father God, I just pray that you would lift her, Father God, just lift her up. And I just pray that we would just look toward you and everything that we're doing father i pray that you'd be with all the rest of the church board members and the leadership of our church i just pray that we would just hear your small voice father god that we listen to who you want us to interview and that we would just glorify you father god and i pray that you'd be with just this whole entire church father The next thing I feel that we should pray for is our congregation. I pray that the pastoral pastor search period will be a time that the church learns to seek God himself more than just a new pastor. Pray for a powerful move in our congregation and cleansing and renewal. So let's just take this time and pray for our congregation.
Father God, I just pray for this church family that we have here, and I just thank you for them. I pray that we have a miraculous sense of love and unity among all the members of our church. Help us to surrender bitterness, division, and anger within our church family. Help us to empower or empower us, love us, and help us to love one another. The next thing I feel that we should pray for is our current leadership. We have Pastor Gretchen, Pastor Josh, and Kendall and Talitha. And I also think we should pray for Pastor Mark and Vanessa. Just pray that we just seek God through this time and that we just know that they're going to lead us to the best of their abilities. Let's have some moments of silence. Father God, we just thank you for our current staff that we have. We just thank you for their amazing leadership that they have. And we just pray that you just bless them as they lead us through this time of looking for a new pastor. And we pray that you be with our previous pastor, Pastor Mark and Vanessa. And we just pray that you would just bless them and just thank you for them. So next, I feel that we should pray for our next lead pastor, next senior pastor in their family. I just think that we need to pray for them, and pray that they would feel their calling to our church, that they would feel the anointmentship that they're supposed to come to our church. So let's just take a few moments to pray for that. Abba, Father, I just want to pray for our future pastor. I want to pray for these two candidates that we're looking at right now, Father God, and I pray that we would have a clear calling of which one we're supposed to interview, and I just pray that you'd be with their families, Father, that their families would feel called to be at our church with their family member, and I just thank you, Father God, for this person, and 
what this person is going to do for our church, and I just pray that they have a clear calling to come to our church. I just pray that you would just bless our church, and we just thank you so, so much for everything you've done for us and everything you're going to do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And that is what I had for our prayer time. At this time, we're going to ask Pat to come up. And in the spirit of prayer, I feel that I should pray for him when he comes up for the message that God's given him. Father God, I just thank you for Reverend Pat. I just pray that you'd be with him as he gives your message, Father. We just thank you for his willingness to come and just lead us and just giving your word, and we just pray that you'd bless him. And just give him the strength just to give your word the way you want it, Father God. We just love you, and we just thank you for this man of God, and we just pray that you'd bless him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. All I have to say is, wow. I want to speak, I guess, to the, to the church leadership, the church board. Because no one has asked me, or first of all, I'm going to share with you, no one spoke to me or suggested on what I should preach upon this morning. And God put a burden on my heart this week to speak not only on prayer, but on a people who are willing and God is searching for to stand in the gap regarding prayer. And I had this on my heart, and, and uh, I'm just like, okay, God, if this is what you want, this is what I will preach on. I don't know why. And then I walk through these doors and I'm sitting here and I'm, heard, I'm hearing from Josh from, for the people of this church to stand in the gap and pray and pray. I truly believe in the, in the power of prayer. You know, Jesus had some things to say about prayer. Everyone probably first comes to mind about what we can read in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by man. I tell you the truth. They have already received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I once volunteered to 
as I was pastoring in El Centro, California. I volunteered to be the one of the chaplains that was on volunteer staff at the El Centro Regional Medical Center there at the hospital there in El Centro. And I received once a phone call from the intensive care unit there at the hospital. There was a man there who was going to see Jesus real soon. His time on earth was very short. They asked me to come and they, they said, I'm, I'm in a pickle, they, the, the nurse told me. <laughs> and she says, uh, this is a Catholic family and the wife wants last rites for, which is uh, a ceremony that a priest would do for one of their Catholic members. And I reminded the nurse that I am not uh, a Catholic chaplain and I will not be able to do the last rites. I said, but however, if you explain that to this, this couple, that I am not going to come as their priest and do last rites, however, I will come and pray with them. And they were happy with that arrangement. And I said, now, just make sure you're clear here because I don't want to drive all the way down to the hospital. It was 2.30 at night. It seems like these things always happen in the middle of the night. And I said, I don't want to go all the way down there and go to the hospital side bed only to be told, oh, I'm not a priest and I don't want to talk to you. Go back home. So, so please, just, just explain it. But I'm willing to come and I'm willing to pray. So I made it there to the hospital and I was invited to the bedside. The man could not speak because he had an incubator tube that was down his throat. But he was awake and his eyes could speak many words. I, I shared with him from the bottom of my heart and I asked him some questions. I asked him if he believed in Jesus Christ. I asked him if he believed that Jesus Christ died for his sins. I asked him if he had confessed his sins to Jesus lately. And I shared him a, a scripture from the Bible that says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I showed him in Scripture where this was in 1 John 1, 9. I led him through a prayer of confession. I led him through a prayer inviting him to invite Jesus into his heart. I mentioned earlier, eyes can say so much. His eyes started crying. I shared with them and I asked them, I said, did you pray and ask Jesus into your heart? He nodded, yes. I asked him if he asked Jesus to confess in, in his confession, if, if he believed that Jesus forgave him his sins. He nodded, yes. I asked him if he felt the presence of Jesus here with him. Tears were flowing and he nodded, yes. I asked him, do you believe Jesus is going to come? 
to your bedside and bring you home soon. And he nodded yes. Meanwhile, his wife is sitting next to his side holding his hand and she's in total confusion. She had never heard a prayer of such a thing. She had never witnessed such a thing as what just took place. And she said to me, is there a prayer that you can pray that, that I know? Because I just prayed from my heart. And I said, Lord, help me in my head. And I said, yes, there is. And I prayed this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come as you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our, our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's going to make me cry now. It's not the coronavirus. It's, it's sniffling because God touched my heart as he brought this, this memory to my heart. You see, there's many ways to pray. Many people will take this prayer and repeat it over and over and over again. But I don't believe that's what God had intended when Jesus shared this instruction on how to pray. I believe Jesus just wanted to connect and teach us how to connect from our hearts to his heart. And speak freely and, and come to him with our, our needs, our desires, our pain, and our suffering that we find ourselves in throughout the day and throughout the weeks and throughout the seasons of life. We can read something here in, in Luke. Let me turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And this is something that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it says that right here in verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. See, Jesus he had a lot to say about prayer. And he was always trying to teach and, and relay and say it in many different ways about how we should communicate with God. And one is, don't give up. He said in verse 2, he said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor carried or cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out <laughs> with, her, with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I 
I don't think it's not enough to just keep it simple in our prayers or keep it real in our prayers. I believe what, what Jesus is crying out for is, is for us to enter into a friendship, a trusting friendship with Jesus. If you look at my Facebook, Ray, I don't know what it's up to. I, I know it's over, I have over 600 friends, and I'm not boasting about that or that I really care. But, but if you go on Facebook, and some people will say, oh, you got X amount of friends on Facebook, you must be popular. I will tell you today that I can count my true friends, not that anyone, if anyone's here, I'm not here to offend anyone that might be a Facebook friend of mine. I'm not saying that your potential is not to become a true friend, but I can count true friends on one hand on one hand that I have. Do you know what I'm talking about, true friends? I'm talking about those people that you can open up and you have utmost trust in. That you can open up and pour out your heart. And they're there to listen to you. Not necessarily to give you advice or tell you what's best for you or tell you what God told them to tell you. How many love that one? No. They're just there, listening. Caring. Loving. <laughs> one of these people, it was uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Patriots were playing, and that's my team. Oh, man, I probably just lost half of you, if not more. All the haters are out there just looking at me. But anyways, I was watching the game. It seemed earlier, before the game had started, he went to Walmart at the next town over, Brawley. It was a good 16 miles down the road. And his car quit working in the parking lot. He had called a tow truck driver, and they were coming to tow the vehicle away. And he's been on the phone. Now, remember, this is Super Bowl Sunday. The game has started. And he's on the phone calling people to come and pick him up. Hmm. He called a friend of mine. A, 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 a mutual friend that we had. He was also a Patriot fan, and he was watching the game. And he said, no, no, brother, I'm sorry. I can't come pick you up. I'm babysitting, he said. I'm like, what a, that's not true. <laughs> he come up with some excuse, and he made one up why he couldn't go because he did not want to miss the game. My phone rang and my wife looked at me and usually when I'm talking and I'm, she goes, you, you, you get something wrong? I says, yes, I have to go pick up someone. You know, to this day, to this day, this friend of mine will never forget what it took for somebody to put down the Super Bowl and come to help them out in a parking lot. That took them a, a, a little bit of a drive. You know, these are the things that, that go beyond. Sometimes that there are just people in your life that you truly, truly can count on. My friends, Jesus is one of those people. We must always pray, he says, and not give up. You know, a lot of time, enthusiasm about praying about a certain thing, 
a certain subject, a certain need, it fades. We may pray the same thing we prayed a hundred times before suddenly the, the breakthrough happens and the miracle happens. And we're grateful that, that we did not stop praying about this. I mentioned before there was one thing in particular about my life that I recall praying probably hundreds of times about. And that was when I had my earlier walk as a Christian, God had convicted me, not so much the Nazarene church, which frowns upon smoking cigarettes, but that was an issue in my life. And I recall people giving testimonies of how they came to the altar and they put down their cigarettes and they left them there at the altar and God gave them the freedom and, and they walked out of the church and never smoked again. I tried that once and I left my cigarettes there at the altar. Not that, I mean, if you have cigarettes here in your pocket and you want to leave them at the altar and God's calling you to do that, do it. I went home. I went back to my, my room in the dormitory there at the Navy base and I broke my cigarettes and I threw them in the trash. I woke up 2 o'clock in the morning with scotch tape, taping them back together and smoking them. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. And I got mad at God. Have you ever got mad at God? I got mad at God. I said, God, this is, I guess you don't want me to be a Nazarene. You know, this is, this is on you now. Don't give me no guilt about smoking. Don't, I don't want to hear it. You know, I gave it to you. I, I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I prayed about it. And I want a cigarette right now because I'm upset. Matter of fact, I walked away from the Nazarene church and I went to the smoking church. I went, I went to this Baptist church where you can go out into the, not the, I mean, my Baptist brothers and sisters that maybe come from Baptist backgrounds, I love you. I believe there's a place in heaven for you. It's just in the smoking section. <laughs> and, and, and I could smoke in the parking lot with my, my, my Christian brothers and sisters, and I was free. I recall being in that parking lot smoking a cigarette and as if I was speaking today, I heard the voice of God in my heart. And it was, is this the answer? See, sometimes we, we I believe that you do not you receive the answer in prayer that you're seeking in the easy way. I think it's something that God's trying to deal in your life and bring something out in your life that he wants to deal with that really isn't about what you're praying about. And I'm like, God, don't you start on me. Don't you start on me with this guilt trip now that I'm, hey, man, I'm with, I'm with the I'm Baptist brothers, and we can smoke here. And he says, no, it's not about that. God spoke these words to my heart. Do you love me more than this? And I said, yes. And God spoke to my heart and said, show me, show me. I'm nothing like a dare. How dare you dare me? I'll show you. And I showed God. I said, I'm not going to smoke because I love you. And when the desire for a cigarette came, I said, God, do you see this? I love you more than this. And you know what happened then? A miracle happened. God lifted the desire and the need for cigarettes out of my life. You see, the issue was there was an idol in my life. And the most important thing in my life was to meet a nicotine need I had in my life. It was God was not 
wanted that space. He wanted that number one spot in my life, that one, number one need in my life. And he wanted me to surrender it to him. It would have been easy. God could have just wiped it off at the altar. But there still would have been something else that was putting God in the back corner in my life. And God wanted to address the issue of who was number one in my life. But we pray, and we pray, and we don't give up. Sometimes this causes things like anxiety in our lives. There have been times that I've been very anxious about issues I've been praying about. And we can read in, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, excuse me, let, yes, 4, 6, and 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. This is the scripture that says, do not be anxious about anything. And we all might stop there and say, yeah, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But there's something bigger here going on. What really stills the anxiety in my heart is often that God is teaching me that I have to learn to be content. Sometimes the answer is no to prayer. And that can cause anxiety in my heart. What do you mean, no? Paul writes, as he continues on in, this, in these verses here, in this same chapter, if you go down to, uh, I'll start in verse 11. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned, I have learned. This is a process. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want. And this is a, a, a verse that, that many people cling to, and, and I hear quoted quite often. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. But what God is giving you strength for and that God is giving you the ability to do everything for is to be content. Surrendering the circumstances in life to, to Jesus and staying focused on asking, what is it, dear Lord, that you want me to do? And I will be continually doing it. Today is uh, my daughter's birthday, and I have a present for her out in the car. I hope... I hope she, she likes the present that I, I, I have for her. In Matthew 7, 11, we can read something about how Jesus explains how God knows how to give the good gift. Let me turn to Matthew here. Matthew, excuse me, did I say I have here? Yes. Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. But this sums up the law and the prophets. God knows what it is that we need. I, I, I have no clue. My daughter is one of these people that's, that's hard to get things for because she just gets whatever she wants. and uh, She has her, her... Usually, it's by the time I, I find out that what she wants, she's already ordered it or went to the store and, and purchased it. So I'm hoping when I was in the store and I saw something, it was not something that she already has because I'll be disappointed. But God knows. God knows what we have and, and what we need. I'm going to go back to what Josh was sharing for, and I'll close on that thought. And this is just food for thought about prayer. It goes back to in the time of Ezekiel. And you can turn to the scripture. It's Ezekiel chapter 22. Let me turn back here. Ezekiel chapter 22. Verse 30. It says, I looked. You see, God's seeking. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. It's not just someone who's willing to stand up and pray and, and hear their voice and... and, and uh, call people up, and we could line the altars and say, let's pray, let's pray. But God is looking for somebody that's willing to stand in the gap and be an intercessory, uh, to intercede, stand in the gap. You know where this comes from? This comes, if you go all the way back in Exodus, it goes back to the story of Moses. Let's turn to, to Exodus chapter 32, verses, I'll start in verse 9. And, and you may remember this. And this is when, when Moses, he went up on the mountain and he receives the commandments. The finger of God writes it down and I mean, he's so close with God that God's shining in his face. And then he goes down the mountain and, and, and there's a party going on. There's sin in the camp. They have built an idol. And this has angered God. It angered Moses too. Then he's ready to destroy the people. This is what he says, what's written in Scripture, verse 9. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that I, my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation, speaking to Moses. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why would the Egyptians say it, is, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel to whom you swore by your own self 
I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land. I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had intended. Are there people willing to stand in the gap? Are there people who are willing to plead with God to do what is right and what is blessed amongst this church, amongst this community? to change lives? Are you willing to plead with God? Not point out all the faults, not trying to fix anything, just say, God, please, please pour out your grace and love. Are you willing to stand in the gap and plead with people and say, this is what God wants in our community. This is what God wants in your life. This is what God teaches in his word. I believe that God put this message on the board's heart to share. I believe that God put it on my heart, this message to share. Yeah, I love it when, when God puts things together and I see God weaving things together at this time. And this is not me. This is not the board asking me to preach on this subject. This is the Spirit of God moving here amongst you. This is the message God wants. He loves you. He loves this church. He loves this community. And he is searching this very hour, I believe, for people willing to stand in the gap. Are you that person? God is looking for. Don't stop. Don't quit. Believe. What a wonderful God we serve. Let's close in a word of prayer. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you are doing amongst these people. I thank you for the leadership in this church. I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, the way your spirit spoke to me this week. And I can see how to this morning, how I can connect the dots and what a wonderful thing it is to see your, your spirit move in action. Dear Lord, there are many, many things that are, are, are moving here, the, but I believe you can work in the hearts of the right person that you are calling, that they will feel the call and the passion and the desire and give that, that family, that, that, that minister, dear Lord Jesus, that, is, that you have chosen, give a warming in the hearts of the board, a reassurance to them as they move forward. May it be clear as day, dear Lord Jesus, to them. For with man, these are difficult decisions. But dear Lord Jesus, as we pour out our hearts to you, open their hearts. Let them recognize your desire. Hold them up, dear Lord. We hold them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I like to close in reading this verse that speaks to my heart in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Pat. And as we close the service and as we leave, you go nowhere by accident, and wherever you go, God has put you there. Wherever you go, God is sending you. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.